Thank you, Emrys. All right, fantastic. Um, so thank you all for joining this morning. Um, I'll just go over a few brief um, housekeeping bef um, points before we get started. Um, if you have any questions um, during this presentation, feel free to drop them in the chat below. Um, we will have some people who can address your questions um, while the conversation is still going. Um, and there will also be a designated Q&A at the end as well um, that we can go over. But throughout the, the time that we're together, um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Um, and we will go over them as well. Um, I will mention as well that um, this record, well, it is a recording, so um, it will be available afterwards. Um, so if you have any colleagues um, who were unable to attend this session um, but would like to see the recording, um, we will be sending it out to those who have registered um, for this program. There will be a follow-up email with some information as well as a YouTube link um, so that can be available to view um, at their convenience. Um, I will, I believe those are the main housekeeping points. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, we ask that um, you just drop them in the chat below. Um, I will um, just give a brief um, league announcement. So um, if you haven't heard already, you probably have if you're on our mailing list, um, the Connecticut League of History Organizations, we will be hosting our annual conference that's coming up very, very soon on June 6th. Um, and if you have not signed up already, we have some really incredible sessions um, that are gonna be hosted at this event. Um, it will be Monday, June 6th in um, Weathersfield at the Weathersfield Historical Society and the Webb Dean Stevens Museum. Um, and it will just be a full day of wonderful networking, some fantastic sessions, um, food will be provided, there will be a reception afterwards, and we're just really excited to have everybody back in person since 2019, and um, especially for myself to be able to meet all of you um, as well. So if you have any questions about registration, um, feel free to um, reach out to me. Um, again, my name is Emily. I'll drop my email in the chat um, as well as a registration link too if you um, have not done so already and I'm happy to answer any questions with that. Um, and I will mention as well that registration is um, discounted for league members so feel free to reach out to me with any questions. So um, without further ado, if I'm not missing anything yet, um, I will hand it over to Liz Shapiro um, who can give an introduction before we get started. So thank you all. Hi everybody, um, it's really nice to be here and it's really nice to see you all. Um, I am gonna be sort of the least helpful person during this entire webinar, um, but you know, I always like to feel like I'm the most helpful person in the room. So um, I, I'm thrilled that we're going to be partnering at the Office of the Arts to work with Scott Wands and Leanne Partridge and the team over at Connecticut Humanities to offer the Connecticut Summer at the Museums program um, again this summer. And I just wanna say, just to clarify, um, this year, uh, the state legislature, and that's who you should be thanking, your state legislators, um, for this boon, um, allocated another $15 million to help fund the Connecticut Summer at the Museums program. And that is going to allow um, kids 18 and under, accompanied by one adult, um, with a lot of room for interpretation, which Scott and Leanne will talk about, um, to come to your participating museum free of charge. And we're really excited to be able to offer that. Um, what I do wanna let you know is that the difference this year is that of the $15 million, $3.5 million has been reserved for what the legislature is referring to as for-profit museums. And I know, again, Scott and Leanne are gonna touch on this, but I just wanted to make sure. The application process is going to look fairly similar. However, if you're a nonprofit museum, if you participated last year, or if you didn't, it doesn't matter. If you're a nonprofit, Scott and Leanne are going to be your resources at Connecticut Humanities. And Amaris and Emily, of course, can direct you to them and also help to answer questions. Um, if you are a for-profit museum, if you are not sure what a for-profit museum is or whether you are a for-profit museum, I would be the person to talk to and I will throw my email up in the chat. But if you are a for-profit museum, your application is gonna come in through the Connecticut Office of the Arts web portal. And I'm actually here, Ron, I'm gonna ask you to wave, okay? So I'm actually here in the back. That's my colleague, Rhonda Oliski. 
and we're trying to maintain safe social distancing in the office at the workplace. And she and I will be the point persons for the four profit museums. And we're happy to take questions about what that looks like later. So at this point, those are the main things I wanted to cover and it's, there's a lot to cover. So I'm gonna turn this over to my um, dear colleagues at Connecticut Humanities, Scott Wands and Leanne Partridge. Thanks you guys. Thanks Liz for that, that welcome and introduction. Um, and, and I just wanna echo what, what Liz is saying here to start off with. Um, that it, it's it's been a pleasure to work with Liz and Rhonda and all of the team over at DECD and the Office of the Arts to help organizations throughout the pandemic um, maintain operations and, and continue to thrive. Um, and it's been a real great collaboration between us at Connecticut Humanities and in, in the Office of the Arts specifically. And thanking the legislature is so important um, for all of the support that they've provided, not just for the CT Summer at the Museum program we're talking about today, but for the general operating support, uh, hopefully all of you have have received at the end of uh, calendar year 2022. Um, they're really seeing the important role that museums, historical societies, cultural institutions, performing arts institutions, presenting arts institutions, um, all of these types of institutions do for our communities and have been providing funding to help keep us um, as stable and, and, and um, thriving as possible in, in what we know have been very challenging times. Um, so, so do take a moment if you have not already, and hopefully you have, um, and even if you have, to do it again, to, to let them know that this funding is appreciated and how it's helping your organization and your community. Um, I'm gonna share screen in a moment here. Uh, I'm gonna take you through some details about the CT Summer of the Museum program, uh, eligibility, application timeline, um, Leanne will be mainly managing the chat to answer any questions that happen in real time, but I want to make sure we leave ample time at the end because I know many of you are going to have questions and want to uh, make sure that we have, have the opportunity to answer all of those. But without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And look at the right part of my screen to do here, which is, of course, below the fold. Here we go. All right, um, as Liz said, one of the major differences between this summer, which is the second summer of the program and last summer, which was the first summer of the program, is that all nonprofits, no matter your size, will be applying through Connecticut Humanities. And the place to go to get information at CT Humanities is our website, cthumanities.org. All of our grant information is under the grant section. And on the right, we have our individual grant lines. And I'm happy to talk at other times about other grant lines, but we're talking specifically about CT Summer at the Museum about halfway down. That's the, the link that you're going to want to go to. When there, we have a tab which is going to have a lot of the information you're looking at here. So the first is the definition of what is this program. And as Liz said, um, this is a relationship between Connecticut Humanities and the Office of the Arts for administering the program and its funding coming through DECD with the Office of the Governor, the State Department of Education, Early Childhood, all from American Rescue Plan Act funds. So there's going to be some things that you'll see later on we'll talk about that are because of how the funds come to us. Um, but it's a lot of people coming together to get this program to you. The overall goal of the program, and we'll talk more about this as well, as Liz said, is to help from July 1 of this year to Labor Day, September 5th of this year, facilitate summer enrichment programs for Connecticut youth. And this program defines Connecticut youth as 18 and under, and it's to enable as much as possible anyone that's a Connecticut youth, 18 or, or younger, and one accompanying adult to be able to come to our institutions equitably without having cost be a deterrent um, to participation. This is not for out-of-state people to be compensated. This is not for um, summer camps and the local Girl Scout troops to, to be busing to your institutions. This is really about family, extended family, Connecticut resident visitation. We, last summer, gave out awards that ranged on the small side uh, from 1,000 to the large side just over $550,000 with the asterisk. We know the, the large five institutions in the state, and I know some of you are here today, have 
pre-arrangements and had awards that exceeded that. But for the vast majority of people on the call, this will give you an uh, idea of, of, of what the funding will look like. Um, we do have a little bit less funding this summer to go around, as Liz said, because a portion of the $15 million has been carved out for for-profit institutions. Um, so awards by and large, I think this summer are going to be a little bit smaller as a result. But we also wanna let you know how we're starting to um, envision those awards will be calculated. So it will be a, looking at what was the revenue from admissions for your Connecticut youth visitation under 18 last summer. And if you participated last summer and you were free, great. This is not some kind of end run to try to, to, to take money away from you. We'll wanna know what the, the cost of that visitation would have been had you charged admission. A percentage of the revenue that you uh, received last summer from the adults that accompanied those youth, as well as we will have um, uh, a base award um, that will be uh, tiered towards your operating budget size and we will look at your operating expenses. So basically what this means is everyone's gonna get a base award and then we will augment that based on the visitation that you have for the relevant audiences we're looking at here. If you do not charge admission, this is another new thing. If you are free all the time, we're not trying to encourage you to start charging admission to get money from this program. That is a, the exact opposite of what we want to have. You're already an equitable institution. Keep being an equitable institution. We will have the ability for you to participate this summer and we will compensate you, again, based on your, your organization's operating budget size, at least in a minimal way, and everyone will get at least $1,000 to be able to help you cover PPE costs related to additional visitation, to be able to market your participation in the program, um, to be able to run some programming that you might want to run in conjunction with this. We want to help cover your ability to participate and, and, and uh, uh, lay some of the expenses that you would incur. Um, not going to belabor, but again, nonprofit us, for-profit Liz. You have any questions, um, you can always email Leanne or myself. Um, and if for whatever reason, you are an institution that wants to participate and doesn't want to get any money, I don't know why that would be the case, but if that's the case, you can click here and register just to be a part of the program. Why would you want to do that? A couple of reasons. This is not all about the money. There's money. It's important to get money. We want to compensate you for doing this. But another wonderful aspect of this is the Department of Tourism is another one of our partners, and they are going to market this program to the general public. And all participating institutions, whether compensated or not, will end up on a list of participating institutions. And you will get increased visibility through this program that people will know about you and your institution. The one thing, and we'll talk about this, I think, more later as well, what tourism is going to do is they're going to have a list for the general public that will link to your website and they will tell the general public, go to the institution's website to learn about hours of operation and how participation will take place at your institution. So anybody that participates in this program, the number one thing to do after award and before the program starts to roll out is to update your website so that the public knows when and how you want them to come to you so that they're not showing up on your door on days and times when you are not wanting them to be there. And this is why Liz said, you know, the goal of the program is to be equitable from July 1 to September 5th. Um, there is latitude in how you roll out the program. As we know, um, awards might not always match up to number of visitation. Um, so your website is going to be the key way to transmit to the public when and how they can be participating. Eligibility. We are looking at museum as the broad American Alliance and museum definition of museum. So if you are anyone with museum in the title, science museum, children's museum, art museum, it's you, but also historic houses, historic sites, historical societies, art museums, zoos, science centers, arboretums, botanical gardens, this program is for you. But you do need to be either a 501c3, a municipality, a Connecticut-based federally or state-recognized tribe, or CT state-operated museum to go through us. We will take all of those institutions or a for-profit 
and going through Liz and her team at the Office of the Arts. If you do not know what the best category is for you and have any questions about that, let us know and we're happy to help, help answer questions and, and, and guide you appropriately. Um, we are looking for institutions, whether for-profit or non-profit, to be registered with the Secretary of State and doing good business, to have your primary place of business in Connecticut and operations in Connecticut. Again, if you're going to be um, applying, we need some financial documents to right size your award. If you don't have that, let us know. We can talk to you about that. And then we're looking for some minimal hours of operation. If you do not have eight hours of week, that is fine. You can be open less by appointment, but let us know what that access is in your, in your application. Um, but being available by appointment is fine. We have our guidelines linked in the next tab, and I will skip this for a second and come back to it. But the one thing I will say is we are really working hard at Connecticut Humanities in the Office of the Arts to make sure if we've already asked you a question from last summer's Connecticut Summer at the Museum program or in the operating um, grants program that we have, the Connecticut Cultural Fund Operating Support Grants, we are not gonna ask you the question again, which means we actually have three different versions of the application that are gonna be live and you will have some question branching questions as you go through to make sure we're giving you the right application for who you are and asking you the least amount of questions possible. If you got a CT summer at the museum grant last summer, you'll have the shortest application. If you didn't do summer at the museum last summer, but you got an operating support grant, you'll be somewhere in the middle and if you've not received either of those two grants, but, but are with us now, and, and we're glad you're here if that's the case, um, it'll be a little bit longer just to fill in some of those gaps that we got from other institutions already that we don't have from you. We're only asking for questions that are gonna A, help right size your award, and B, start giving us a larger picture of who our whole museum world is in Connecticut so we can continue to advocate on your behalf and to speak about who we are, our size, our budgets, our number of employees. Dates. We went live a little bit later than we want, but this is the way government works. We had to get this through the legislative session and to be approved to be able to, to start to roll it out for you. Uh, that said, we want to have applications in by June 3rd. We know that's next week, but we've tried to, again, streamline, make the application as, as quick as possible. We will let you know. Our goal is to let you know what your funding amount is and that you are going to be receiving award by the middle of June. We're shooting for that week of June 13th. Um, we are going to get contracts out as quickly as we can. And our goal is to have contracts out so that you can accept your awards by June 22nd. But, or at least let us know that you want to participate in the program. You will accept the award notification that we have by June 22nd. I can't get contracts out until after that. We will have contracts out between June 22nd and the end of the month. We cannot start paying this program until the middle to late part of July. Why? This is a 2023 fiscal year program. The state will not start releasing funds for anybody in any budget area until after July 1. We've got that holiday weekend right after July 1. Um, Liz has to get the money from the state government. Liz has to then send the money to us. We have to send the money to you. So it's going to take a few weeks you will be running this program essentially for, for a good chunk, if not all of July, without receiving your first funds. But your funds will be secure. We will let you know what they are, but from a cash flow perspective, know that we can't get you funds until we have funds to get to you. We also have a frequently asked questions tab, and this is uh, something that came from uh, our knowledge of last summer, and we'll continue to, to grow it as, as questions come in this summer, from where does the funding come from, to what do we do if we're not open eight hours a week, but we're available by appointment, and as we already said, yes, you're eligible. Um, if we're awarded, what can the funds be used towards? This is an important thing. These are American recovery plan funds. So we do have a more limited series of buckets that your funding use can go into. Salary, any way you wanna look at salary, full-time, part-time, new positions, returning positions, contractors. Beyond that, it's a little bit more narrow. It can go to any kind of PPE costs at your institution, sanitizer, masks, cleaning to keep your place safe through the summer for your staff and your volunteers and the public, advertising and marketing to get more exposure, 
beyond what the Department of Tourism will do for you. Supplies and, and, and educational materials. So anything that you will be doing stuff wise, whether it be a special program or a regular program, um, as you welcome those guests into your institution and onto your properties. If you have questions beyond this, let us know and we will get you answers. But these are the buckets that are allowed from ARPA funds and where we need to get those funds to get matched back up to. If we don't charge admission, can we participate? Yup, as we already said. How are we calculating the award? Again, we're not trying to, to ding anyone that participated last summer. So our instructions here, if you participated last summer, we'll calculate what your revenue from admissions would have been using your visitation numbers and your regular cost for admission. Our 18 year olds considered children or adults for this program, we are counting them as children. And we know this is slightly different than um, the surveys that we've done with Susie Wilkening. Um, don't stress over the 18 year olds, do the best of your ability to put them in the right buckets for admission to this program, as well as be counting first for Susie Wilkening and our um, year round numbers going forward. Um, we ask for financial documents that detail our revenues and inspections. What can we do? So you could use financial statements, budgets, profit loss statements, budgets with actuals. The one thing we're not allowing this year that we have accepted previously is 990s. The 990s are just not getting us enough information. We need some more line item information, at least on a top level, about where your revenue sources are coming from and where your funding is going towards. We can ask and answer more questions about that. Um, we are a museum that's never charged admission, and we're going to be opening a major section in ex exhibition for which we'll be charging admission. Are we eligible to apply? Yes. Let us know some of these changes. We've got places in the application to give us information about why your situation in 2022 is going to be vastly different than it was in 2021. Um, this program is for regular admission visitation. So again, as we said, it's not studio classes, community days, school tours, home school days. So you do not need to take that bus from the Y and let them all in for free. The goal is not for groups of summer youth, it's summer youth with their accompanying adults. Um, we've talked about what benefit, it's not just about the money, it's about the, the added visitation and being a list of your peers. How will we know what our award will be like? We won't know until we know all who the applicant pool is, but we'll guarantee it will be at least $1,000. And in many cases, it's gonna be vastly higher than that. Um, the more visitation that you have, the larger your operating expenses are, the larger your award is gonna be. But last summer we had, I think it was around 71, let's correct me if I'm wrong, participating institutions. And we want to, with the help of, of the league and you all, grow that number to well over 100 and I'm shooting for doubling it. Um, I'd love to get us towards 120, 140. We know that there's those number of museums out there and we'd love to have you be a part of this program and on that list and it shows the governor and the legislature that this is a growing program and that it's a, uh, a, a something that everyone in their communities will find a place to go to. Um, after the contract's completed when we receive the actual funds, as I said, we are hoping to be able to get the funds in hand to be able to distribute them to you all um, by mid to late July. The last thing I'll do is I'm going to show um, the guidelines and then I want to open it up for, for any comments that Liz has for anything I, I missed um, um, and then uh, any questions that you have. Um, our guidelines, again, it's, it's linkable off of our page in many different ways, but we've got a guidelines and application question right here. You can actually preview all of the different types of applications before you go into our system. At the end of the day, I think most of you now have um, accounts in our grants submission portal. If you don't, you'll need to create one. It only takes a few moments. The only thing you'll probably need that you don't have off the top of your head is your employer identification number. That's your uh, number that matches you up to GuideStar security um, and, and, and charity checks. Um, but for the guidelines, just a quick couple things here. You will see more information about the funding amounts and eligibility. Um, the requirements, which we already went over. This program is not for individuals or for organizations that aren't in compliance with our previous grants. Um, we have very, very, very few organizations that have compliance issues. If you have never been told about a compliance issue, it is not you. It doesn't mean that you've got an open grant. You can have open grants with us and still apply. It would mean you did something deep, dark, and bad, and, and very, very few places have ever done anything deep, dark, and bad. 
We have the eligible expenses, which I won't go over because we already did. But I want to point out there is no match. This is not a matching grant program. You do not need to get $1,000 of value to match. No match. You're just an outright award. The duration, the grant period, the period of performance, the period of when we're tracking attendance to judge your award on, and we're going to ask you to count to give us back the numbers to show how well you did is July 1 to September 5th. That said, because these are ARPA funds, we have a crazy long application period of when you could spend these funds. You could have it go back to March 3rd of 21, which is when the American Recovery Plan um, was signed into law, and you're allowed to go forward into December of 2024. God willing, you will find lots of expenses to be able to spend it on really soon so that you can close this out and that we're not trying to expend funds. You can't close out the grant until you've expended the funds. You've got a little longer window than the period provides. I hope none of you draw it out until Christmas of 2024. That seems like a long ways away for me. There are funding exclusions, but again, we've got a limited amount of places the funding can go towards, but by and large, it's all the fun stuff. I always say this, you can't be gambling with it. You can't be um, bribing your legislators with it. Don't bribe your legislators. But one thing that I will point out for this program, if you're, if you're open hours and you're doing programs and you have food, alcohol, or refreshments, that is one thing that we do not allow the funding to go towards. So that is not a programmatic expense for this program. But pretty much with the things above, almost anything you can think of is gonna be allowed Unless you said for this program, I wanted to buy a Picasso, you can't be buying artifacts, works of art, or documents for your collections either. These are some of the funding restrictions for the use of this uh, pot of money. Um, if you're doing honoraria, just know you can't be doing it for elected officials. You can't be, again, in a roundabout way, lining the pot of your, in pockets of your legislators. You can't be paying CTH staff or board. I can't get extra compensation through this. And you are not allowed to be paying your own board members' um, fees and, and stipends for this. So if you do compensate your own board, it's not a best practice. I'm not going to stop you from doing it. I will stop you from using these funds to do it. So uh, just one thing to keep in mind. Um, and with that, I am going to stop sharing screens. We've talked about how to apply and where to apply. Um, and we will ask Liz if there's anything I missed or you want to say, and then we'll open up to you all for questions that you have. So thanks. The only thing I would say is just pertaining to um, Steve's comment in um, the chat about the UEI number, which um, Leanne responded to. We are actually aware of the fact that people have been experiencing delays in getting their UEI numbers. So um, as um, Leanne said, not having one will not allow you to hit the submit button. So what you'll need to do is contact Leanne and she will make a note of that and submit that application for you. It will not prevent you from applying. We will eventually need those numbers because now that I've gone through the first round of reporting for ARPA, which is my job, um, every organization needs to have a UEI and that's how we manage the reporting. It's through, it's through the UEI for the federal government. So we will need that number no matter what, but we don't need it upfront. Yeah, it's part of the report we're gonna to have to put. Every organization is gonna to need to match up to, it, to an eligible and active UEI, but we do not need that by June 3rd. Um, and for any of you that are going through the process, please follow the links that we have through the Office of the Arts website to get your UEI. There are some evil people out there that are charging institutions money to get a UEI it is free. Do not pay money to get this number. This is a free number the government requires and does not make you pay for. So yeah, and um, Jen, there. so Duns and Bradstreet still exist. There are still Duns numbers. Actually, Leanne, Duns aren't, UEIs are not the new Duns number. UEIs are numbers that SAM.gov, which is the federal granting platform, are now assigning to organizations. The SAM.gov used to use Duns and Bradstreet numbers, your Duns number, as your unique identifier in the SAM.gov portal. They no longer do that. As of this year, they are assigning you their own um, generated 
identification number. And so that's what the UEI number is. And um, if anyone applies for any grant that is funded through any federal government, so most of Connecticut Humanities grants, all of our grants, any almost any grant that comes from trickle down federal money, you need to have a UEI number. Yeah, we know that Money Place is getting it for the first time, but as Liz said, it's a one-time thing. You'll have it forever. Hopefully they won't be changing this anytime soon. I mean, uh, this is this is the intention to be lasting the government and, and anybody that, that gets funds through the government for, for quite some time into the future. All right, what do we have for questions? Usually I have Amherst do this, but Amherst is a little bit hard of voice today. I don't know if you want to do it, if you want yeah, to have Emily do it. I think Emily can step in here. Um, Jen, it looks like Jen had a quick follow up on um, on the UEIs there. Right, so the, answer, the answer, Jen, is not necessarily. Log on and check. Yeah, and and, and Leanne, I know, put the link here to the information page about UE, uh, UEI that um, the ECD and Liz and her team put together, and that's how we're directing everyone, and that's how you'll know you're you're doing the you're, the right links. If you do some Google searches for it, you'll probably find some of the the scammers out there. Maybe. Maybe we should talk a little bit, Scott, about um, what happens if my award doesn't cover the number of visitors that I expect to get in the door. Um, and I think that that to me is sort of the biggest, baddest question of them all following up on Scott's biggest, baddest things that museums have ever done. Um, so because we're working with less funding this year for nonprofits, and we are hoping to have more nonprofit museums involved in the program, as Scott said, it is likely that you will receive a smaller award than you did last year if you received an award. That said, rather than change the, we had long discussions about this, as I'm sure you can imagine, and rather than change the parameters of the program to confuse the people who participated last year and all the messaging we did last year, what we decided to do is ask you and also on our part work with the office of tourism um, in the, their marketing budget for this program to really really do everything we can to proactively guide visitors to each individual participating site so that you can choose how to interpret the program and make it work for you so what i can say is that for most last year and this is a very general statement. For most smaller museums, and that's gonna be a lot of the people on the call today, you are getting more money from this program than you would have generated in, in income from visitation. That is sort of the over the general. Um, and it worked really well for you guys. And the extra money could be used to do you know, other things, PPE, all those kinds of things that you need. And also hire staff to handle what might be increased visitation. All cool. Um, However, um, I can speak, I know that there's a, I, I don't know if they're actually here, but children's museums are a special breed of museums and their operations model is really, really different than, um, yeah, I knew kids, play. I saw that, I wasn't sure if they were here. Um, their operations model is just really, really different. They're really membership organizations. And for those of you who have kids and grandkids, you know that you join, you don't pay when you go, you join as a member, so you can go in whenever you want. And so this model of funding didn't really work for them, but um, they were really psyched to be able to participate in this program. We are just, you guys make the program work for you. We will do all that we can to, to manage, to get in front of any misunderstandings. Um, there were very few, and honestly, Scott and I only heard of some visitor issues with either the large five museums that we always talk about that really we can't even put them in um, in a in a discussion with the rest of us, unfortunately. And those are Mystic Seaport, Mystic Aquarium, Norwalk Aquarium, the Science Center, and the Beardsley Zoo. Their visitation, when you look at it, it doesn't nobody matches their visitation. It was it was multiple multiples of what the next closest institution was for visitation last summer. Each mm -hmm. one of them received. So you can, I'm looking at Peter's comments. So you can decide what you want to do about this program. What I will tell you is that, so Mystic Seaport last year took a fairly substantial loss on this program. What they found is that their gift shop membership diversity of visitors increased so much 
that they were happy to take the loss because they looked at as essentially free advertising. Um, so they didn't have to spend money advertising because they had so many people in the door. Um, the and other their, thing is- their revenue was up in those other places. And the New England Air Museum is another great example of this. They had so many people coming in that they couldn't keep up with the gift stock, uh, gift shop stock. They just kept selling stuff. So they just, they if they lost some money at admission, they made it that people had more money in their pockets. The people that were going to a, a museum that had a boat ride you could take paid for more boat rides because they weren't paying money for admission that were had shop, uh, gift stores were spending in the gift store that had restaurants were spending in the gift shop. So mm -hmm. leverage the opportunity that comes to you in whatever way that is. And the other thing is you have people, you have the chance to give people a really great opportunity and make people members. So I think that has to be something that every museum has got to decide for themselves. And yeah, Leanne is totally right. Once you get your, if you're not monitoring the chat, once you get your award notification, you do not have to accept that award. Um, you do not have to participate in the program. So that is complete, this is completely up to you. This program is designed to, It, this is a this is a program that is the wish of the of the legislature. I would say that if um, Scott Amaris, Emily Leanne, and I designed it, it might look a little bit different. However, um, this I'm going to just go full circle to where we left off at the beginning of the legislative session, and at the be you know when you were hearing from Amaris and Scott and all of us about what this idea of advocacy means, which is you need to know your state legislature. And now is the exact moment because they're done with the legislative session. This is the time to reach out to them and say, we are participating in this program or not. And this is why. And I can't wait to let you know what happens at the end of it. Because if everyone who participated did that, I would almost guarantee that this program will continue. It may look different, but it will continue, or there will be other funding for museums in the future. If none of you do that, there's no way that Amara Scott, Emily, Leanne, and I can do that for you because we don't matter, because we don't vote for your own legislators. Right. So I, I just, I can't say it. I say it. I feel like I say it until I'm blue in the face. It is not something that you, that's, it's not a choice. But, but you have control, as Liz said, you know, on your website to, to create the rules of the program, which could be in what Mystic Seaport did last summer, and which is the hope if sufficient funding comes to your institution, that walk-in visitation is fine. As long as our open hour, as long as we're open and here's our open hours, you can come between July 1 and September 5th, and any number of children, Connecticut children with an accompanying adult will be free. Other institutions we know have online ticketing and they're requiring online pre-advanced registered tickets to be able to go. Some are saying, you know, mornings will be a, a charge and afternoons might be free visitation. This is where, you know, as Liz said, you need to decide number one, if you want to accept the award and number two, what the rules will be for your institutions and the public that visits you to, to go visit you. And then you need to update the website because that's how people are going to know. And, and, and the worst thing is when the public comes to you at a time in a way other than, than what you want um, and, and gets frustrated. And we want as few people to be frustrated as possible all around because that doesn't, that doesn't help your institution and it doesn't help um, the program. Um, there was a question about, can you have an operating support grant and a CT Summer at the Museum grant? Yes, this is a whole separate grant line. It does not matter how many grants you have with us or the Office of the Arts or combined, it's a completely separate thing. We would love for everyone that got operating support that qualifies for this program to apply for and receive this program. How do we count summer visitors? We have square dances and then pe many people asked about the artifacts, et cetera. So again, this is getting into, do you have not special programs like a square dance? And I've been to your square dances, they're fabulous. Go to Blue Slope and, and square dance when they have them. But that's not general hours. That is a special program ticketed thing. It's when people can come and visit your institution and the museum exhibits and, and experiences that you have as a regular drop in or by appointment, not for that 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 big program you're doing. Um, and and that's the opportunities you should be providing back in some way to the public and the numbers you should be counting 
uh, as we right size your award. Uh, Amherst is saying, I would encourage everyone to think of this not as a financial arrangement, though there's a lot to be gained from participation other than cash. And that's so true. I mean, again, this is really showing the state who we are and what we do. And the more of us that participate and the more of us that, that give positive experiences to our communities and that we can report back on, um, I think the more funding is going to come to us in other ways. The visibility you're going to get from this program is going to increase your, your exposure and uh, people wanting to come back and see you other ways. And just like any opportunity, when you get people in the door, yes, there's a transaction that has to take place to get them across the line to do whatever the activities are that you offer, but then they're yours. Leverage that opportunity in whatever way it is. Um, talk about the value of membership. Talk about some of those special programs. Let them know about the square dance and why they should come back and square dance with you on Friday night when they will have to pay a fee. Um, and again, I mean, the gift shop, those people that had opportunities that could buy, when people don't spend 20, 40 more dollars to bring their family in, they open up their wallets in other ways. If you accept donations, encourage people to make a donation. Say, if you had a great time today, I know this was a free experience. Um, this program only covers a fraction of our costs. Encourage them to make a donation and let them know why that, that would be important and how it would help your, your institution going forward. It's not a requirement, but people will open up their wallets more uh, through this program. There's also the ability to capture information, right? So we are going to ask you at the end, how many people did come in the door? We're not gonna ask you to break it down too much, um, but we do, there are things that we are gonna wanna know because we wanna be able to share that information and um, ensure that we're learning from everything, all of this funding, what is actually happening um, as a result of the funding. So um, I know many of you have um, been paying attention to what Connecticut Humanities has been talking about in terms of the, uh, what the reporting requirements and ask is of you to track visitation. Um, and Connecticut Humanities has some really good resources on their website to help you do that. But at the very least, and you guys know, for most of you know, I ran a small historical society for years and years. If you can get that email, um, of, the, of your visitor in the door, then um, that's coming in the door and add that to that, that person to your email list. And as long as you're following best practices where people can opt out of your email once they receive it, you have a chance to um, make them, you know, move them to a member and then through the cycle to becoming a donor. So for those of you who are always wondering about, well, we need to grow our membership or how do we actually grow our donor base? This, I will second what Scott said, this is a really good opportunity to do that. So I would encourage people to think about, you know, really what your risk tolerance is here. For some of you, there may not be risk tolerance um, once you see the name of your, your, the amount of your award, and we totally get that. Um, but I would encourage you to think about what are the benefits besides the funding um, to your organization. And I did put in the chat now, um, some tips for data collection that our um, data evaluator, Susie Wilkening, has, has provided to us. So the, the, the first link I have there is, is data collection tips and a template as a PDF at the end. The second link, the, the last one I put up, is just a Word document. Use it. I mean, these are only three of the things we're looking at, but it's, it's ways you could ask about age, um, where the visitors are coming from, and their demographics. And as my cat steps on my computer and hopefully did not disconnect me, um, hi Leo, uh, you know, these are ways that you can um, start to either ask your visitors this and have them fill it out, or you could just do tally marks. I mean, heck, knowing how many kids and adults are Connecticut each day at the, at the, the desk, if you're a smaller place is great. If you're a bigger place, obviously it's a little bit more complicated, but this is the, the, the reasons and the ways that we're gonna be asking people to report back on data for operating support. And it, we want it to connect as much as possible to Summer at the Museum um, and the data you collect for this program. Can, can I also jump in here? I know that my voice is very unpleasant to listen to right now, and I apologize for that. But I just want to say um, just another thing anecdotally. 
Um, the other value um, of this is the kind of free publicity that you get from the state of Connecticut by being listed as a participant in this pro program. And I can just tell you that, so I have a three-year-old, he was two last summer. Um, you know, my, my parents take care of him during the week. Um, and my mom used to go to this list last summer and just be like, where can we go today? Um, and I, I would, imagine that there are a lot of grandparents, parents, caretakers, you know, siblings, aunts and uncles, whoever out there who once they find out about this program, you know, they'll just look at that list and they'll be like, well, where can we go today? Um, and if your museum is on that list, it's much more likely that you're going to be getting some of those people through the door. Um, so it's just such a great opportunity to have that free publicity with all these other great museums across the state of Connecticut. Um, you know, it, when I saw that last summer, I was like, this, this is going to be really great. And I started looking at it myself and I learned about places that I didn't know existed. So um, I just wanted to share that little story. I do. I would second that. I just threw up there. Um, yeah, it's the, the try before you buy. If any of you ever order anything from Amazon, that's now an option on Amazon. And I think this is it. Like, if it doesn't cost anything to try it, people are more willing to try it. So it's, it's, you know, this is really, honestly, this is an experiment in human psychology. So um, see what you can do to, you know, you get people in the door, make them yours, make them love you. Um, because I think we're gonna learn, we learned a lot last year from the program. And I will say for those of you who participated last year, we downloaded all of, everything that you gave to us, all of the information, including your comments in a spreadsheet. And while we did create a report, we shared the entire spreadsheet with the members of the state legislature. And um, I, this program got funded because of the comment section on that. There's, I, and I will tell you that I know that for a certainty. So, and at a certain point too, um, the governor proposed funding in at $15 million and the legislature, when they brought their counter proposal, moved it to a $5 million fund. There's nothing we could have done at $5 million that would have really, I mean, we would have had to really trunk, it's not, there's nothing. We would have had to really change the pro program parameters to make it work for $5 million. But it's because of you guys, the participants who saw that, contacted us and we were able to say, yeah, you might want to talk to your state legislator and let them know that you really think that this program is valuable and, and should be funded. Um, so I would love to have this program right now. It's not funded with state funds, but this is really the first program that has that where the governor and the legislators have seen museums as educational organizations that work in partnership with schools that are a valuable tool for the Department of Education um, and that serve a vital role in our communities. Right now, as of this year, they believe that to the tune of $30 million, $30 million. None of you, I, I've been around this field for maybe longer than most of you here now, which is really sad to say, but never, Never, this has never ever been done in Connecticut. You all know that the state is, has been running budget surpluses. And yes, it's incredibly important to put money into infrastructure to pay down our, um, you know, our pension debt. There's a lot of things the state needs to be, you know, investing in. But two years of, of this funding and maybe next year, right? Cause there's still ARPA funding hanging around We've sort of set up a situation where legislators have said, yeah, museums are super valuable. And now how can they kind of go back and say, yeah, not really anymore. So I think I would just urge all of you to think about the big picture of what this means to the museum sector in Connecticut. No state in the country has anything like this. No. So that it's that's pretty cool and again if we lose five dollars over here we're going to get fifty dollars worth of value over there so i really do encourage you to look at this beyond the transactional dollar for dollar basis because as liz said this is multiple years now 
of state support, in many cases coming from federal relief programs, but not entirely. They have opened up the general fund for relief as well through the CT cultural fund and the operating support grants you have. And the more we keep showing them that we're doing good work, we're serving our communities, we're bringing people in that then eat restaurants and um, do other things in towns, and we'll keep track of this to be able to report back out on, on your behalf, the more this is not just a two-year thing and it's going to be something that's more permanent. And other states, as Liz said, are not doing it. When I told my counterparts at other humanities councils, when all the grants officers got together for a quarterly meeting about this, jaws dropped because the, the other states aren't, aren't making funding available in any sort of way like this. Um, we have a question from Andy. Liz, can you, I, I wanna make sure I email Andy and others the right version that you wanna share. So if you can send us back what you shared with legislators. No, no, I was thinking about your data sheets. You, you got, you're the ones who put together the data sheets. All right, so, so that's fine. Yeah. Okay, I, I didn't wanna make yeah. sure I was, was not, all right. We, uh, we, will, we will share something back out, Andy. Those are the, those are the data sheets. If you, um, I, I would say that the raw data is, available, of course, I, I don't think it's of use to many people, but if you do want to see that, um, just shoot me an email and I can I can share that with you. It's pages and pages of Excel spreadsheets. So probably it's more than most people want. Um, so, and Andy, that's a really good question. So yes and no. Um, so um, in, so, okay. So short, short form of the answer is in 2016, <clears throat> there is a study, um, uh, uh, Americans for the Arts does a study called AEP, AEP Arts and Economic Prosperity in 2016. They did Arts and Econ Economic Prosperity 5, AEP 5. Last year, they were supposed to kick off with Arts and Economic Prosperity 6. Um, it has just kicked off this month. Now, how does arts and economic prosperity um, translate to like what do museums have to do with that? Well, um, the participants in that AFTA study, um, the qualifying participants include museums and historical societies, arts organizations, theaters, um, all a whole variety of arboretums, you know, zoos. All of those organizations are considered to be qualified participants. Right now. Um, working, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice too, Amaris. Right now, working with um, our designated regional service organizations, and if you don't know, um, you have a designated ser regional service organization. Um, they are the feet on the street collecting data and visitor um, intercept studies at arts and cultural and organizations across the state starting now but going on basically for the next six to eight months. Um, I can put in the chat um, a list of how you find who your designated regional service organization are. Many of them in the past have served mostly arts audiences, arts organizations, but now the majority of them are really looking at arts and cultural sector. So the Shoreline Arts or the Shoreline Arts Alliance the organization that's been doing um, all of the work on COVID and, and um, the cultural community, um, they, um, are, they are a designated regional service organization for the Guilford sort of um, some part of the shoreline area. Um, the Cultural Coalition of Southeast and Northeast New England is another one. Uh, Greater Hartford Arts Council, um, New Haven, Greater New Haven Arts Council, Fairfield Cultural Alliance. Sometimes I forget all their names but I'll put a link to those. And if you want to participate, you could do that. But there are findings from AEP five and there will be new findings from AEP six. Finding brief finding from AEP five is that for every dollar spent on arts and culture in, in Connecticut, I believe it generates seven. Um, so, but we're kind of waiting for new data at this point. And as Amara said, AM and NEMA do have some state by state fact sheets. I don't, I-, I I've I put I put some of them in the chat here. Okay. So I put the most recent statewide data from the American Alliance of Museums, which I think was the one I put up there. Um, I've also put up our data stories from how we're crunching the data from the operating support. And I'm trying to find the most recent New England one. I found an older one, but I want the 2022 with a link online if I can find that. So I'm looking for it now. Okay. 
I'll keep looking. If I can't find it, I will uh, do something else. Here we go, Connecticut. No, that's just a graphic. So they all look, sorry. So they all look a little bit different, um, but I'm very optimistic about this AEP6 uh, study because this is the first time we have multiple partners. Um, and indeed New Haven, the city of New Haven is going to do participate only as the city of New Haven. So New Haven is gonna get some really granular data. And I just put up the link to the um, designated regional service organization. So, so I guess like we're coming to the end of time. Um, we're all here for questions, all of us. Um, you can reach out to Amaris, Emily, Scott, Leanne, or me, or Rhonda, who you can't see on film, but she does exist. There she is, see, she's still here. Um, I put our information in the chat. We will be happy to help you with questions. Um, remember that Scott and Leanne are the folks who are running the program for nonprofits. If you happen to know of a for-profit museum, feel free to um, send them my way and I'm happy to talk to them. Um, and Amaris, uh, Anne, oh, Anne yeah, has, Anne right has a question. Yeah, go ahead, Anne. Anne, you're on mute in case you're not sure. Okay, and you know how to get in touch with Scott. Oh, Anne's off mute. She's off mute. So, so, sorry, I, I hit the wrong button. I was reading chat things. Sorry. How do I get rid of my hand? Oh, you're worried about that. that. Yeah. Okay, cool. How can I help you, Anne? Do you nope, have a question? I, oh, you're all set. Okay. No, sorry. All right, well then how about this? Why, why don't we stop recording. I want to thank everyone again. I want to thank Amaris and Emily especially for hosting us. Uh, they've been great. Um, hosts of all the Zooms and info sessions we've been doing throughout the pandemic. Uh, thank Liz for, and Rhonda, who I can't see, but I know is there for, for all the help that they provide. Rhonda, Rhonda's awesome. If you guys don't know Rhonda, Rhonda's awesome. Um, and uh, I can hang around for a few more moments if there's any questions that people wanna uh, do uh, at the end after we stop recording. Great, yeah, thanks Scott. Thanks Emily for kicking us off. Um, thanks Liz, Scott and Leanne for, um, for all this great information and um, We'll get this up on our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with those um, who were not able to be here. Um, and I also wanna just remind you um, to register for the league conference on June 6th, um, clho.org slash conference slash 2022. Um, you can look at the preliminary program. Um, we really look forward to seeing you in Old Weathers Field in less than two weeks. Liz is going to be there. Leanne yep. and I will be there. We're going to have a grants table where you can just come by and talk to us about anything on your mind with grants. Yep. It's going to be a great time. Have a great uh, afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everybody.